Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you all for having me today. We're going to take it back a little bit to the basics um, with this talk and really just go over some of the principles and data um, supporting the treatment of hepatitis C in individuals who are co-infected with HIV. So I have no disclosures. Just wanted to provide a disclaimer about the funding for ECHO and some data considerations. So as you all know, co-infection with hepatitis C um, and HIV is common, and uh, much of that is owing to shared risk factors. Among persons living with HIV here in the U.S., it's estimated that somewhere between 15 to 30 percent also have hepatitis C. And then in the U.S., approximately 5 percent of persons with chronic HCV have HIV co-infection. Although historically rates of hep C co-infection have been highest amongst persons living with HIV who inject drugs, data over the past 10 years or so has also shown us that MSM, living with and without HIV, are also at elevated risk for hepatitis C via sexual transmission. And the data I'm showing here on this slide is from a recent systematic review and meta-analysis that evaluated HCV prevalence and incidence in MSM and found that the pooled HCV prevalence in MSM was about 3.4%. Just to give you a comparison, the NHANES estimates for the general U.S. population, which is, of course, likely an underestimate, is about 1% amongst U.S. adults. And they broke that down by HIV negative and HIV positive MSM and found that the prevalence amongst HIV positive MSM was much higher at 6.3%. But then when they looked at HIV negative MSM and they stratified by those who are on PrEP and not on PrEP, you see there that the prevalence amongst individuals on PrEP was significantly higher than those not on PrEP. And likely that's due to higher rates of sexual risk factors conferring risk for hep C. So we also know that co-infection with HIV accelerates the progression of hepatic fibrosis in patients with hepatitis C. And we know that patients with HIV are less likely to spontaneously clear hepatitis C than those without HIV. And data from you know, the interferon age shows us that cirrhosis has been observed to occur 12 to 16 years earlier in persons with hepatitis C and HIV co-infection versus hepatitis C alone. The graph you're seeing here on the right side of your screen is just from a paper published back in 2001 of hep C duration and prevalence of cirrhosis in, by year. And then we also know that hepatitis C remains a leading cause of death amongst people living with HIV, and up to 80 to 90% of liver-related deaths in persons with HIV are actually attributable to hepatitis C. So it's really important because of this high rate of morbidity and mortality that we treat people living with HIV who are also co-infected with hepatitis C um, and as you know, we have a really durable and relatively easy to obtain cure for hepatitis C these days. And so that makes it even more important. And the pretreatment assessment for hepatitis C in patients who are living with HIV is very similar to that in mono-infected individuals um, and really has three pillars. So ideally before treatment, there's going to be some assessment of fibrosis that was typically done via liver biopsy, which is a prior gold standard, but that's not routinely recommended at this juncture just due to other available methods um, and the high degree of morbidity that can come with a liver biopsy and complications from that. So today we usually prefer transient elastography or fiber scan if that's available. That provides a nice reliable measure of liver fibrosis. But other non-invasive tests that are laboratory-based, including FIB4, are other options and oftentimes used when FibroScan is not available. And I should mention that there is data supporting the use of FIB4 in co-infected individuals. The other thing that you want to do before treating somebody for hepatitis C is a labor baseline laboratory evaluation. And it's pretty straightforward. So you want a CBC and a CMP anywhere between three to six months prior to initiating treatment. A hep C RNA, that can be at any point prior to treatment, um, so you don't necessarily need to repeat that. And then I only get genotypes, specifically in genotype 3 patients with cirrhosis, 
when I'm considering using cefosfavir velpatosfir. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but essentially it has to do with the recommendation to get resistance testing. So even genotypes in our co-infected individuals are really not necessary in most situations. And then you do want to make sure you're screening for hepatitis B. One, because there's a high occurrence of hepatitis B in people living with HIV, and also because you can see hepatitis B reactivation in people when they're undergoing hepatitis C treatment. So that's really important. And then finally, we want to do a medication and drug-drug interaction review, and we'll go into it a little bit later about the interactions between some of the direct-acting antivirals for hepatitis C and our antiretroviral therapy. So although people with HIV have historically been considered a hard-to-treat population, um, and that was certainly the case during the interferon era where we saw lower rates of SVR12, Data from multiple studies, more recent studies with direct-acting antivirals, indicate that SVR12 weights and cure rates are pretty much comparable among patients living with HCV mono-infection and those living with HCV-HIV co-infection. And I'll go into more depth here about the Expedition 2 trial and the Astral 5 trial, which are trials um, really supporting the use of glucapavir pibrentosphere, or GP, and sofosfavir glopatosphere, or SOFVEL, in the co-infected population. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanted to provide just a bit of like basic background information about glucapavir pibrentosphere. I'll oftentimes refer to that as GP just for shorthand. This is the first pangenotypic NS34A protease inhibitor and NS5A inhibitor combination to be approved. And it offers a really potent treatment option for the vast majority of patients with chronic hep C. This drug is not an option for patients with decompensated cirrhosis given the presence of the protease inhibitor. But in the main registration trials for treatment-naive individuals, uh, sustained virologic response rates after eight weeks of GP were in the range of 95% or greater, with very few treatment failures or uh, virologic breakthroughs. So as I mentioned before, the Expedition 2 trial is really the main trial looking at GP in a co-infected patient population. This was an open-label phase three trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy of this fixed-dose combination for either eight or 12 weeks in patients with co-infection. This was done at several different settings across the world, and it included people with genotype one through six. You had to be treatment naive, or you could have been treated with older versions of hep C treatment, including PEG interferon, plus minus ribavirin, or plus minus cefosfavir. And they allowed patients with compensated cirrhosis into this trial. You had to be either on ART or ART naive with a CD4 count of greater than 500. I will say the vast majority were on ART and about two-thirds of the individuals in this study had a CD4 count above 500. So what did they do? They gave individuals who weren't cirrhotic GP for eight weeks, and then they gave individuals who had compensated cirrhosis GP for 12 weeks. And what you can see here is in the intention to treat analysis, the SVR12 rate was 98%. And in the modified intention to treat analysis, it was 99%. So excellent rates of cure. When they broke this down based on cirrhosis, there was 100% SVR12 rate amongst those without cirrhosis. And then there was a 93% SVR12 rate amongst those with cirrhosis. And you can see there's low numbers there. And so there was one uh, genotype 3 patient in the study with cirrhosis who had about 85% compliance with medications and had an on-treatment virologic failure. Looking to cefosfavir velpatosfir, this is a pangenotypic NS5A, NS5B inhibitor that's a single pill combination regimen and has very potent activity against hepatitis C. In contrast to GP, it can be used safely in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, Um, as it doesn't contain a protease inhibitor. And similar to GP in the main registration trials for treatment-naive individuals, SVR12 rates were 95% or greater, with very few on-treatment virologic failures or post-treatment relapses. The ASTRAL-5 study is the study of SOFVEL that gives us the data on use in co-infected individuals. This was a single-arm, open-label, multi-center phase 3 trial, and it looked at SOFVEL for a duration of 12 weeks. Entry criteria included having genotype 1 through 6, so any genotype for hepatitis C, you had to be an adult, have HIV co-infection, 
And here um, they required a CD4 count over 100 and you had to be virally suppressed on stable ART for at least eight weeks. And they allowed some prior treatment failures, but really not like DAAs. They were prior interferon-based treatment failures or old protease inhibitor treatment failures. And then uh, patients with compensated cirrhosis were allowed. And so pretty straightforward what they did. Everybody, regardless of cirrhosis status, got soft fell for 12 weeks. And what you can see here is that all of the SVR12 rates broken down by genotype were greater than 90%. The two that are a little bit lower, the genotype 1B and genotype 3, you can see mostly that was just due to one patient being lost to follow-up or one patient withdrawing consent, and this was in the intention to treat analysis. And then when they broke down the results by treatment experience status or cirrhosis status, you can see that there was overall good SVR12 rates in the folks with cirrhosis, actually 100%, although the numbers were low, 94% percent SVR12 rates in those without cirrhosis, and then the treatment naive experienced a 93% SVR12 rate and 97% for the treatment experienced. The last study I'll highlight is one that supports the use of a minimal monitoring approach to hepatitis C treatment in individuals with and without HIV co-infection. So this is also known as the MINMON study, and that was published uh, last year. This was a phase four open label single arm trial that examined safety and efficacy of this minimal monitoring approach, which I'll go into in a little bit, to hepatitis C using 12 weeks of cefosivir valpatisvir in treatment naive patients. So this was done at multiple sites in Brazil, South Africa, Thailand, Uganda, and the United States. You had to have chronic hepatitis C, of course, to enter into this trial. You had to be treatment naive. You had to be 18 years of age or older. HIV co-infection was permitted, um, although this was not specifically a co-infection study, and people with compensated cirrhosis were allowed in as well. So in this study, they did not do genotypes, and they assessed cirrhosis based on FIB4 alone. They provided all of the pills, so the whole 12-week course at entry, and what they did is they provided remote contact at four weeks and then again at 22 weeks to check in on patients, and then SVR12 measurements were done at the 24-week mark or 12 weeks after completion of therapy. So a very minimal approach to, to treatment and monitoring. I just wanted to highlight that actually a relatively high proportion of individuals in this study were HIV co-infected, 42%, almost all of which were virally suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. And results from this study were really encouraging, 95% SVR12 rates across the board, including those with HCV monoinfection and HIV-HCV co-infection. So where does this data leave us in terms of how do we treat hepatitis C in people living with HIV? So for treatment-naive individuals without cirrhosis, the two preferred regimens, and really they're preferred because of their efficacy and pangenotypic activity, include GP for eight weeks or SOFVEL for 12 weeks. In treatment-naive individuals with compensated cirrhosis, there is some differences based on genotype. Um, so for genotypes one, two, and four through six, you can either use GP for eight weeks or SOFVEL for 12 weeks. You may remember that in the Expedition 2 trial, they actually studied a 12-week duration of GP for co-infected individuals with compensated cirrhosis. So the initial recommendation had been to use 12 weeks in these individuals, but now there's some real-world data that suggests that an eight-week duration is okay. And so in the OI guidelines, they list eight weeks as the preferred duration and 12 weeks as an alternative duration. And then in treatment-naive individuals with compensated cirrhosis, if they have genotype 3, GP for eight weeks or 12 weeks is the preferred regimen. And the reason for that is that people who are treated with cefosivir or velpatosphere and have genotype 3 and cirrhosis need to undergo NS5A resistance testing. And if resistance is present, then you need to add ribavirin. And so if you, you know, don't want to obtain a genotype, going with GP in the setting of compensated cirrhosis is a safe bet. But if you need to use the fosfovir valpatosphere, then you would want to get a genotype in somebody who has cirrhosis to ensure that they're not genotype 3, or if they are genotype 3, 
that you would then go forward with resistance testing before starting the DAA therapy. And you might say, well, how do I choose between, you know, GP or Softvel? Honestly, most of the time we're choosing based on insurance, right? So here in Washington State, as many of you probably know, there is an agreement with AbbVie, who is a producer of GP to provide GP for Medicaid patients. And so if somebody's a Medicaid patient, that's going to be the preferred option. As I mentioned, if somebody has decompensated cirrhosis, you would not want to use GP based on the protease inhibitor that's there. And so Softvel would be the best option. Although I would advocate that if somebody has decompensated cirrhosis, they should probably really be treated in a liver transplant kind of institution and by a specialist. So if you're not somebody who does a lot of hep C treatment, that would be a good patient to refer. And then there are a few common drug-drug interactions that we see for these individuals. So GP um, doesn't play well with high dose statins. And so if somebody recently had an MI um, and needs to be on 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, that would be you know, a, a reason you might want to choose Softvel. Softvel does not play well with PPIs. So if somebody has um, you know, erosive esophagitis or, or something where you need a high dose PPI, then you may prefer GP over that. So again, those are some of the more routine drug-drug interactions. Speaking specifically about HIV, drug-drug interactions, you know, we really don't run into this this day and age with our frontline kind of first choice ART therapy. So what I'm highlighting here is that you can see with um, the cefosavir velpatosvir, I guess, column here, and then the glucapavir pibrentosvir column, for most NRTIs and in integrase inhibitors, there's really no major contraindications. I'll say this yellow box here for TDF was just really a a comment about ensuring you're using TDF in people with normal renal function. So if people are on a TAF-based regimen with dolutegravir or TDF with dolutegravir, you're really good to go. Um, it's more the PIs where we see contraindications, specifically with GP, right, because that also contains a protease inhibitor, and then um, with pharmacologic boosters and some of the older, less favored NNRTIs. Things like rolpivirine and duravirine are fine to use, but efavirenz is a no-go. So just briefly before we conclude, a comment about laboratory monitoring and people who are on hepatitis C treatment. So even patients with co-infection mostly will not require any on-treatment monitoring and can be treated with a simplified approach. There is some kind of risk of symptomatic hypoglycemia in patients who are taking medications for diabetes concurrently with direct-acting antivirals, so they should just be counseled to monitor for hypoglycemia. And then similarly, patients on warfarin should be informed of the potential changes in their anticoagulation status while on DAA therapy and should undergo INR monitoring. And although the, the risk of liver decompensation during DAA therapy is very rare, some clinicians choose to do LFTs in patients with compensated cirrhosis. That's not a, a strong recommendation, but I oftentimes will do it because we may be checking in with patients monthly. And then finally, all patients should, of course, undergo repeat hep C RNA testing and liver function testing at 12 weeks post-treatment to assess for cure. So to conclude, HIV and hep C co-infection is common owing to sharing risk factors. Co-infection with HIV accelerates the progression of hepatic fibrosis in individuals with hepatitis C, and hep C remains a leading cause of liver-related deaths in people living with HIV. GP and Softvel are the preferred regimens to treat hep C in patients with and without HIV, really due to their efficacy, low side effect profile, and pangenotypic activity. And then many patients with HIV can be treated for hepatitis C using a very minimal monitoring approach, and most won't need any on-treatment monitoring. For the most part, GP and Softvel play well with most of our first-line ART, but beware of drug-drug interactions with the PIs and the NNRTIs. So with that, I will conclude, and I'm happy to take any questions that folks have. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.